Now, it's always, it's always very, very difficult to, um, to sort of think, to, to sort of follow through a thread. There's just so much that could be said about the history of women artists in Australia up to the present day and also where we may place them culturally and how we place them and the politics of placing and valuing art. Um, you could, I could speak for 30 hours. I could give a whole university unit on this issue, but I've got to refine it into a 45 minutes to an 45 minutes sort of time frame. And what I've ended up doing, and also there's the, I find organically that lectures and papers often end up at a certain place that they want to end up rather than where you plan them. But we will, I will be covering this. I'll be covering much of what Anthony said. I'll also be um, particularly focusing on historiography, that is the way history is written, the way history is recorded, the way that people read history, the way it's published, which, and the sort of often the very conflicting views within the whole concept of history as generations pass, different aspects, different philosophies are emphasised and the same phenomenon can be looked at from many different ways. And in some ways, there's no better place than this building to be talking about this topic because, well, even when I came here, I walked right around and I said, well, it's the only building that whenever I come here, I'm entering from a different door. And as we all know, of course, it's, I think it's had two or three different orientations. It faced one way, then it faced the other way. Uh, so it, it is itself, we are in a building that tangibly reminds us how subjective history is and also how interpretations known to, uh, are themselves mobile. No interpretation is finite. And particularly, it's not just the political aspects of Eureka, but also the fact that even the very earliest documentation talks often tells quite a different story, and yet it is authentic, it is first-person account, it is everything that you expect a reliable historical source to be. So I am going to talk about historiography rather than a direct account of chronological lives and experience. And in so doing, I, alas, have you know, left out many, many, many interesting women artists because they're particularly central Victoria is very rich in the history of late 19th century, early 20th century women artists with um, both Bendigo, Castlemaine and also Ballarat having very particularly rich histories. The picture that's on the advertising and also at the front of the um, Front, on the front of the lectern. I won't actually, in the end, she didn't turn up in the, in the PowerPoint, but I'll just advise you that it is the remarkable Alice Bale of Melbourne and Castlemaine, one of the great supporters in the 20s and 30s of the uh, Castlemaine Art Gallery, a very major realist painter, a very determined and professional woman from the 1890s onwards, a woman who never saw herself as anything other than, other than a professional artist. And that image, the sort of uh, the image of her that she painted as a young woman around about 1905 in full Edwardian finery and yet, yet with a palette and standing at an easel and sort of and looking sort of very determinedly out of the picture uh, sums up her the whole sort of intensity and totality of her professionalism. But yes, uh, another day I can talk about all the artists, women artists of central Victoria and I also sadly... Um, Sadly, left out um, Dora Olfsen, who is, was a major Australian sculptress who went from Ballarat to uh, Mussolini's Italy. It was the only woman sculptor to ever do a war memorial under the fascists. Uh, she later spent World War II behind the Axis lines and then died in an accident in her flat soon after the end of World War II. But she um, grew up in Ballarat, was regarded more in Ballarat as a musical prodigy and became interested in visual arts in, uh, in Europe in the 1890s after she left Australia via from Ballarat to Sydney. She moved with her pet father, who was a, the, the engineer for the Ballarat Water Board, who then got a job in Sydney. So Dora moved out of Ballarat and then she moved from Sydney, from Ballarat to Sydney and then to Berlin 
and then to St. Petersburg. Had very, very interesting life. May have also been a spy for the American government in Tsarist Russia. And also people such as May Grieg and Marley Cahoon, both of whom uh, came to Ballarat and worked for some substantial period of time as lecturers at the Ballarat School of Mine, now, now Federation University. So there is a really strong... Um, narrative of women creatives around Ballarat and of course one of the most famous women artists of the in popular memory today of course Clarice Beckett she spent considerable time in Ballarat and also returned as an adult to paint as returned after she left Ballarat, after the family left Ballarat she returned and painted there and in and in uh, properties outside Ballarat probably which belonged to Friends, school friends of hers because she was an ex-pupil of Queen's College. Now, um, one of the interesting thing is that I will possibly centering my lecture on is that there is a very strong divide between popular, uh, non-professional interest in, the his, in history and the interest in women, women artists from gallery visitors, from people who are interested in art, but not art professionals. There's been, and there's a very different take in the last 50 years between art professionals, curators, academics, and their, their opinions of women artists, and public opinion, which from the mid-1970s, when uh, you started to get exhibitions by people such as Janine Burke and Rosalind Hollenrake, uh, there's been an intense fascination with women artists, and this has... This has continued constantly uh, throughout the last half century in the face of a lot of art professionals being a lot more sceptical about women artists in Australia. Uh, it might sound a bit strange to say that there's a lot of scepticism about around women artists, but there is was until so about 10 years ago a very strong um, resistance to them both in public gallery narratives and in university narratives. There are always feminists and outliers who are promoting women, but the general structural system, systemic point of view on women artists in the art profession in Australia was, yes, there are a few good ones, but most of them were irrelevant, conservative, and not worth thinking about. But um, stories such as those of Joy Hester, 1920 to 1960, and Clarice Beckett, who lived from 1887 to 1935, have remained fascinating to a general public for, as I said, 50 years. Uh, both of these artists were rediscovered in the 1970s, sometime after their death. In the case of Clarice Beckett, it was virtually another sort of half, it was virtually 40 years after her death. In the case of Joy Hester, it was about 15 years. And um, there have been generations of publications about six or eight of, and different exhibitions on both women in the last half century. These the stories of both um, Beckett and Hester have really captured public imagination. They've been current and unfading for nearly five decades. They um, have moved from the art gallery into other fields. Uh, there are novels, there are films. On the, on the left we have a, um, an advertisement, a cover of the video of the uh, documentary on Hester. And there's been, a, there are films, there are sort of scripts that are sort of optioned. No one's actually got the film up and running, but there are, there's been a lot of projects around actually getting a fictional film up and running with Joy, about Joy Hester's life. And the one on the left is a novel called Night Street, which is about, it's a painter called Clarice, who lives in Beau Morris, who paint, has a, a very repressive parents and who paints at dawn and dusk. But she also tends to do what the real Clarice Beckett didn't do. She occasionally goes cruising for men and has rather sort of interesting encounters with them, which of course is grist for the mill of a novel, but um, is certainly not art historically or personally true. But it just gives you an indication of, of the way these stories have leached out into a wide range of popular culture. Um, they are, I think they're so popular because they are in both in some ways, the life story of both women are a sort of wish fulfillment story. It resonated during the 70s with a great uh, growing awareness of feminist concerns broadly across society and also particularly resonates with the idea of the overlooking and sidelining of female contributions to public life and culture, which was very much a current 
topic of discussion in the 1970s. They also, these stories also endorse and validate perspectives drawn from female life and experience within a narrative of national cultural identity, given that art in settler Australia has been used very much to sort of define who we are, what our myths are, what the sort of the collective cultural concerns are, and particularly things such as the Heidelberg School, Sydney Nolan, Brett Whiteley, but also in some ways, Clarice Beckett, Joy Hester, Margaret Preston, all of these artists have been sort of co-opted into a narrative that's far bigger than just talking about art history or art techniques or theories of content and practice in art. And they do have a much stronger traction. Um, they also are highly engaging and move, moving. They resonate widely today, as I've said several times, partly because the artworks are strong enough to float above the hype and the various uses and deployments of the story. But we also, I think it's because these stories resonate with people. We see the stories move from the gallery and the art auction from the sort of, and the university, the sort of areas of professional art debate into the moving image beyond the art catalogue and also into novels. I think there's also, Clarice comes into a second novel about the death of Molly Dean, set in the 1930s, which was a murder case that involved Touch the Meldrum Circle, of which she was a part. So there are a number of stories in which ways that these artists t turn up. Um, I'll just show you. And we can also look at the sort of, there's a couple of examples of the histories of the publications from different, this is covering a couple of different eras and you can see the way that, not only it's the same subject, but different um, book formats, different design protocols with the one, the fussy one on the left being of course much more from the 1970s, 1980s. And you know, look at those sort of slabs of color behind the script, the sort of, Comic Sans type script, which is now very unpopular. And you've got a much more minimalist catalogue. And again, you see the same thing. As I said, there's about eight publications on both women. Uh, again, you see the same, th same aspects with different era publications of um, about Clarice Beckett. The one in the grey sort of long one is, I think, from the seven, is a very early one from the 70s. The one with the darker sort of the dark sort of, it's not avocado, it's a, a sort of the darky tealy green is uh, around about the very late 1990s, 2000. Again, look at the very different scripts. Look at the fact you've got a, um, on the one on the, on the left, you've got writing that's, that's vertical rather than horizontal. But it just gives you an idea of how the sort of, the way that these women have lived in the popular imaginary. And here, just on the left here, is currently in, uh, we've just, uh, due to COVID, we, they truncated a Joy Hester exhibition at Heidi, but it had been on over the last couple of months, um, which was sort of by, you know, you had to have, ticket, you had to be ticketed, and it was, didn't get the, pop, the audience that it was expected due to circumstances. But we've just had opened in the last couple of weeks, a new Clara Beckett show in the Art Gallery of South Australia. So um, that's the catalogue to that. And on the left is an American dress by a company that does um, digital prints. And if you can see, it's a bit fuzzy, but it's an actual Clarice Beckett dress made by an American design studio, thanks to the uh, modern technologies of digital printing. Uh, but there it is, you can sort of see the road, and I've actually got the same painting a little further on in the lecture, but you can see the road and the, the telegraph poles. As I said, it's a, um, we've seen how these stories keep being revisited by different generations, by different contexts, both art professionals and also a much broader sort of audience of, of the cultured and liter literate. And, and um, the, the artworks sustain this level of another indication of the strength and quality of the artworks is that they can sustain this level of interrogation. A small, thin oeuvre doesn't allow for much more interpretation. A broad, deep, significant oeuvre and sort of artistic vision is one that different generations can revisit, draw something new and fresh from, while acknowledging the previous history. And this is the sort of richness that we get again in the uses and historical in, of, of these artists and the historical interpretation around them. 
Uh, and the popularity of these stories exists in the face of masculine-centric stories that are repeated pub ad nauseum in the public gallery. And for example, we just see advertisements now and press releases telling us that this winter is going to bring us yet another lone exhibition show of French Impressionism from a US gallery to the National Gallery of Victoria. I mean, I enjoy seeing these works, but how many French Impressionist shows have we had, I think, in the last, say, 30 years? And also, too, women's paintings are generally, there may be a Mary Cassatt or two, there may be a, um, there may be a um, Eva Gonzalez or a Berth Morrison, if we're lucky, maybe a um, Marie Brachmond, but very, very, you know, you might get one or two women's paintings in a whole exhibition of 80, 80 works. More about that later. Um, so women are generally, at least in Australian curating practice, still the token minority in the blockbuster shows. We've had our first really big blockbuster open in the National Gallery in Canberra, again, totally compromised by COVID-19. Um, it was a huge show, one of a pair of shows which is going to totally show women artists in the National Gallery of Australia um, for a whole year, from mid-2020 to mid-2021. They're changing the gallery over in June. It's been extended, and there'll be another display of women from the collection and also drawn from collections, public and private, across Australia. And that's why I, th I think this, this current show in, in Canberra is so important because of the lack of women in these very big popular blockbuster shows, which is ironic because every time you put on a women's art show in a public gallery, the visitation grows up, goes up palpably. It has been seen by people doing entry surveys that people like the general public like women artist shows, and until very recently, curators have tried to resist them a bit. Now, going back to the story of Hester, um, I think one of, it's not just hype that we like and are fascinated by her story. Uh, she was very much, it was, it's a very tragic and very moving story. She was driven very much by the, from starting off as just being a radical and a, a rebellious anti-conservative artist, she became increasingly driven by an awareness of the transience of her life and the fact she was living on borrowed time, having been diagnosed with a cancer in the middle of her, in her 20s, um, given nine months to live, and then through surgery, she actually had about another, say, 14 years of life, which she didn't expect. So she it was very much aware of the rapidity of time passing, the transience of life, the fragility of life, and also the presence of darkness and death alongside every positive experience. And also, I think we, when we look at her work, we engage with the alchemy by which the most emotionally astute member of the angry penguin groups and the Heidi groups um, was, par was partly condemned to work on cheap and scrounged material. She was generally not working in the main sort of glamorous parts of the house, on the tables, in the studio. She was generally working on the floor and, and producing work that was just seen as sort of Joy's scribbles and not really considered with any seriousness. She considered it very seriously and presented in a number of exhibitions, often accompanied by her unpublished poetry. But it actually, despite the fact it was marginalised at the time of its production and was in such sort of fragmentary and fragile material, often on butcher's paper, often very thin tracing paper, done, painted usually with watercolour or very diluted inks with and brushes and very, very quick. She'd sort of lay it in on one go and let it dry and do another one. She was extraordinarily prolific, uh, unlike the very large considered oils of, say, someone like Nolan and Tucker, Tucker, her, her partner, particularly laboured over works, redid them, did them in series, repainted them, he was a very, he was almost like a constipated artist. He, he, it took him a very hard time to birth a painting, whereas she was, she just, they just fell off her fingertips. And we can sort of see, um, not only do they, does it communicate to us, we see the briefness and urgency of her life almost as read from the very rapid lines in the, in the drawings. Equally, her subjects have a very direct image, energy that's immediately perceptible, and her focus on the world of relationships, children and motherhood communicates to many viewers even today across a range of generations. The world return of her work to prominence and renown also becomes an emotionally compelling story of affirmation and transcendence, as well as a story of a nonconformist, radical female life. 
Likewise, the Clarice Beckett story is one of transcendence and restitution. The middle class woman pushed to the side, having to take care of her parents, whose, whose supreme talent is only re revealed after the rescue of her paintings from a rural outbuilding as they rotted on her sister's property and stayed there in the outbuilding. Some people say it was an open-sided barn. The photographs I've seen suggest it's a dairy shed, or, a witch, so it, or an old dairy shed, so it's sort of a mud brick adobe type of building and it's actually much more enclosed than people said, than the, the myth suggests. This tale takes on a almost mythic quality, quality and it becomes a sort of metaphor about the validation posthumously of women's unappreciated efforts. Clarice Beckett's exhibitions in public galleries generally attract a very wide, mostly female visitorship, very wide class and educational background, very wide age background, everything from sort of teenagers to senior citizens. It's um, gallery staff in many galleries have spoken about the way that when there is a Clarice Beckett exhibition, there's a really big swell in attendance. There's generally are swells in attendance for all women artists' exhibitions, but she's one who speaks very, very broadly to the community. There is a similar effect with Joy Hester, but her works may appeal to a slightly more edgy, edgy market than the very broad appeal of Clarice Beckett. There's also the sense with Clarice Beckett's stories that the works themselves are, as the Art Gallery of South Australia says, they are survivors of decades of neglect, and yet now they are recognised as one of Australia's most important paintings of the interwar period. This is precisely the way that the, Gal the Art Gallery of South Australia is selling the exhibition, the sort of rescuing of what were, n what were neglected paintings on a in a farm shed now recognised as the most significant artworks of the 1920s and 30s in Australia. Now, Beckett's, I think, quite an interesting person to focus on, not only because of the narratives around her, but because, of course, she's a woman who has a very strong connection to Ballarat, which not everybody realises. She was born in, Ca she grew up in central and western Victoria. She was born in Casterton. She was the daughter of a bank manager. Then the family moved, as being in a bank, people were moved around, and she spent a significant amount of time at Ballarat, in Ballarat, as a student at then Queen's College. And you can track her a little bit through the local press in Ballarat as a prize winner, as, uh, particularly as a violinist in musical competitions and musical examinations. And she also gained a number of prizes in, um, at Queen's College. There is a legend that she actually wrote a play that was performed by the students to much acclaim. I can't find any account of that in the press, but the courier, of course, isn't in trove newspapers because it's still... Under, it's still it's still in operation, and they keep everything. I think they keep their back issues very much, um, very much under their control. I mean, there is physical copies and microfiche in libraries, but without digitisation, you can't do word searches, and it makes it a lot, lot harder to actually search. She may, Clarice may also be at seventeen years of age, the Miss Beckett in Azure Silk noted amongst the guests at the 1900 Ballarat mayoral ball. Although, as she was still in school at this stage, I think this might be a misidentification of possibly it might be her mother rather than a Miss, it might be a Mrs. E. Beckett rather than Miss C. Beckett, but it does say Miss C. Beckett in Azure Silk. But generally, at around the late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, women didn't come out in inverted commas, into society until they'd finished school. So I'm not certain who that was, the Miss Beckett in Azure Silk. As I said, I think it could well have been more likely to have been her mother. Um, her family later moved due to bank postings and also spent time in Bendigo and later moved to Melbourne and then her then retired, the family ret father retired into Beau Morris after she had been painting for some time. As I said, she is... She is appealing because she's very relatable to many middle-class families' histories, particularly after the First World War. There was a generation of unmarried middle-class aunts who were often expected to run the household and take care of the ageing parents as they were unmarried. A whole generation of young men and fiancés and potential husbands or even actual husbands had died during the war. So there were these 
middle-aged and ageing women who lived till the 60s and 70s. That generation was visible in the Australian suburbs. And Clarice, as well as being an artistic figure, I think is very much a representation of that gener a representative figure of that generation that's often overlooked historically. Uh, so Clarice was very much embedded in sort of middle-class family obligations, taking care of her parents, running the household, particularly as her parents age. They retired to Beau Morris. They no longer had were living on a large income and there were no domestic servants. And of course, women left domestic service in very large numbers after, during the First World War. So it was a very much a changing period for suburban life. And it fell, all the burden of these changes and running the household fell very much onto Clarice. Uh, part of the tightly controlled atmosphere, which was even stricter than most families of that generation, she was not permitted, even though she was in her, by then in her 30s or 40s, she was never allowed to have her own dedicated studio at home, unlike many other artists, and she was not allowed to bring any professional peers and colleagues home to the family because it was not seen as quite the nice people that she should be mixing with, so much for the novelist who suggests a figure like Clarice picked up guys randomly in the streets of Beau Morris. Um, and one of the reasons I think that the, there was this very dense and quite oppressive psychological atmosphere in the Beckett household was possibly due to the fact that there was a third child in the family, two daughters and another third child about whom little is known. He had a breakdown or perhaps an accident and acquired a a brain injury in his early teens and was from adolescence onwards sent away from Casterton to, ver and to various institutions. The family felt very much a loss of professional and social status if the stigma of having an injured child, a child who was seen as um, probably was brain injured through an accident, um, a child who was seen as subnormal would be stigmatising both their professional and social status if it was more widely known. So there's sort of very tight secrecy and sort of enclosedness about the psychological narrative of the Beckett household. She diverged very much from the expected narrative of the class and time by her commitment to professional art training and later by her solid commitment to painting. She angered her parents by refusing what they believed were suitable marriage offers when she was in her 20s. Her sister Hilda, who was a little younger, later, later married at a somewhat late age and herself had a somewhat fairly stormy marriage. I can remember someone saying they were coming up to the property and found saw her working in the opposite direction saying, I'm leaving him, I'm leaving him. Um, but Hilda stayed on with her husband because that was where, in, in the end, the works were found up near Bernalla. But um, the other thing is, that although she's seen as forgotten in the mid 20th century and rediscovered in the 70s, she had a very wide following in Melbourne in the 20s and 30s. She, uh, for 10 years, from the late Mid 20s to 30s, she organised an annual exhibition. She contributed works to groups that she belonged to, such as the 20 Melbourne Painters and the Melbourne Society of Women Painters and Sculptors. Uh, the image of Clarice leaving home at dawn and dusk when her parents allowed her spare time with paints and board on a converted tea trolley and exploring the beaches, coastal bushland, and roads of Beau Morris uh, when her parents had retired to that suburb has captured popular imagination and not the least because she in the end died of pneumonia soon after her parents died when she had freedom. She was caught in a storm while painting and tried to get and was thoroughly drenched coming home and died about two weeks later, pre, just pre-penicillin um, from pneumonia. But another interesting link to Ballarat is after she left Queen's College, she came back to Ballarat and studied with a local art teacher, Eva Hopkins. Um, very few works known by her, but this, which is, uh, this is in, it's in very poor condition. It's in a private, it's in a collection. It's waiting to go into a museum. It needs to be restored. This is just a sort of happy snap because uh, it's, you can see the, the reflect camera flare on the top edge. But this is painted, we think, about 1890s in Ballarat in Windery Parade. Um, Eva Hopkins did have her, her family did allow her a studio. She lived in Windery Parade, although, um, yes, yes, she lived in Windery Parade. I think, I was sort of thinking, was it Yarraree Parade? No, it's Windery Parade, um, very different suburb. But she was in Windery Parade. Um, 
and she's a elusively documented character, but we do know that she was a student of Walter Withers, at least. She organized a very large private art school in Ballarat that ran for possibly 20 years. Um, there are occasional press accounts of the very, she used to occasionally give exhibitions of her pupils' works, gave them prizes, and they were, had gala openings, sometimes opened by the bishop, the Anglican Bishop of Ballarat. And she had some uh, de degree of entrepreneurship running this art school. We just have very occasional glimpses in the press about this. She's always described as a well-known teacher of painting and drawing in the press. So she's very much respected. Um, she also appears to have been close to and active in the Anglican Church in Ballarat. Her mother, Matilda Hopkins, was famed as an early teacher, an early headmistress of Queen's College. Uh, who died in 1919. At that stage, Eva left Ballarat and settled in, movement, in, in Melbourne. She settled, left Ballarat and settled, settled in Melbourne, and her movements around to fashionable holiday resorts were noted in the social pages. And in an interview after her mother died, uh, she stated she wanted to travel further in Australia and paint bushlands and rural, rural scenes. So she obviously felt she was a bit constrained, again, like Clarice, having to take care of her mother. In, in Ballarat, and she had a very large sale at the end of, um, as she moved out of Ballarat, she had like a clearing sale, a lot of paintings at very cheap prices, and they said um, an opportunity to buy at reasonable prices, so lots of attractive scenes of Sturt Street, Lake Wendery, and also gardens and buildings on properties sort of at Learmont, and a very wide circle of properties and stately homes sort of in the Ballarat region. So people may have some of these paintings at home, how huh? little did you little do you know? Or in fact, there may be some of her pupils' paintings that um, she had a very, her exhibitions of pupils had say 20, 30 people exhibiting paintings. Uh, and so possibly, so we know that uh, Clarice in the early 1900s studied drawing and painting with Eva Hopkins. So. Eva is from Ballarat and was um, Clarice's teacher. It's a beautiful late 19th century painting, I think. The decor, things such as the drapery around the fireplace, the um, use of sort of dried plants and flowers, very much almost still a little hint of 1880s aesthetic movement, especially that sort of greeny, pale greeny um, wool, walls of distemper, the sort of painted plain walls. This is quite a radical interior. And of course, the sort of the probably Turkish Middle Eastern rug, very much a sort of the fashionable avant-garde decor of the period. But this, I presume, is the, is, is the house in Wendery Parade where her studio was. And also too, due to Clarissa's years at Cla uh, Queen's College, Beckett had quite a few contacts amongst landed families in central Victoria. And at least on one occasion, one of these families offered a respite from the pressures of caring from her parents by inviting her to come and stay for an extended period, a month or so, on one of these properties. I suspect that the sort of the, either the daughters or the wives of these pastoralists she would have met at, at school. And there are a couple of paintings from from the area. We know she also returned to Ballarat uh, to paint without staying with other people and long after Eva Hopkins had left. This is a beautiful painting of the Cedar Avenue in the Ballarat Botanical Gardens. This of course now is the Prime Minister's Avenue but this is painted about 1927 before the Prime Minister's busts about five or six years five or six years before the Prime Minister started appearing. But this is one of her works from that she actually came back to Ballarat to paint. So she was definitely drawn to this area. And we also know she painted, as I said, in properties in the sort of around Ballarat and a little further west. And although the legend states that Beckett enjoyed neither critical support nor collector purchase during her lifetime, a central Victorian art patron, a Miss Maud Rowe, bequeathed outstanding works by Claris and other terrenal painters to both the Ballarat and Castlemaine art galleries. These are very significant works by Claris, and there's 
two or three in both the, there's, I think there's three in the Ballarat Art Gallery and there's a couple in the Castle Main Art Gallery, uh, which were bequeathed in 1937. There are other tonal painters such as Colin Collinhan, Eustace Jorgensen, also bequeathed to both galleries by Maud Rowe at this date. And again, as with Eva, Eva Hopkins, perhaps I know very little about Maud Rowe, but she had a very interesting art collection and she definitely liked the tonal painters. And we know she was publicly minded because she gave these paintings after her death to the two regional galleries in central Victoria. And again, we should like with Eva Hopkins pause and consider about the contribu contributions of these women as patrons and organizers in central Victoria and beyond. And the story of women's art and professionalism is not just about the makers, but it's also about the roles that later became more codified as curators and, and registrars and sort of gallery professionals, these sort of patrons and teachers support people. So women were active in all facets of art making in early years in Australia, from about the 1880s onwards. I mean, it's another story about the emergence of professionalism from the 1860s to the 80s. And again, as I said, as with Hester's works, Beckett's paintings have merits beyond the hyperbole. I'll just show another one. They're just very, very, very typical. Rainy day, coastal Melbourne, but probably Beaumaris, Sandringham, the telegraph poles, the reflections, that very restrained. Sometimes she moves out of that restrained tonal range. You see yellows, oranges and blues, but this is very typical, the grey, green quality of this sort of, of the tonality. And I think one of the reasons also beyond the hyperbole and also the legends of Beckett's life, I think the reasons they attract people is there's exquisite poetic tension between representation and abstraction. There is, I think people respond to the painting of everyday street scenes, both as mundane and yet extraordinarily beautiful. The way that she can draw poetry out of scenes that we know, you know, street scenes, telegraph poles, traffic lights, tram poles, electric tra train, you know, catenary train electric grids and things like that. You know, she her paintings of say the yards at Flinders Street are remarkably beautiful for such images of such ugly places. And the whole idea of the um, street scenes as both mundane and beautiful, and yet also her imp imposition of grids of perfect formal patterning and design is both ta approachable and tangible and very relatable. And yet it also, I think is what's fascinating is that it's almost like a Rothko. It encourages us to think a lot more complexly about the visual world, about visual perception, about the arrangement of the world around you and how we look at things. It's so they're both realistic and yet they also engage you with a much more abstract and conceptual way of thinking about how the world looks and is arranged. Now, I will say this whole idea of both with Hester and I might just have a... Sorry. I will say one interesting thing that links both Hester and Beckett is this idea of the um, cache of works being hidden from the public for so many years. It almost seems like a cliche, it almost seems hyperbole, but as a curator and academic and researcher, I have, cre I have encountered such stories frequently in Australia. And I just thought I might show you a couple more of these lost caches of works. Um, so we have people such as a Heidelberg School era artist, Isabel McWannell, uh, died very young. She died due to tuberculosis and a collection of her works was kept for two generations within the family. No one wanted to sell, throw out or get rid of the works because they were a, a tangible reminder of this young woman who died barely into her 30s. And she was a Sydney-based artist and this is a beautiful scene of the Hawkesbury River. And this whole theory, people say, oh, women just painted very domestic landscapes. They didn't paint wide vistas. They didn't paint sort of landscapes that were sort of heroic. Uh, this is pure Heidelberg School, very beautiful, very beautiful um, paintings. She did a lot of very poetic, um, decorative, almost Art Nouveau watercolours, and then she did these plein air landscapes. She was a very, very, very talented artist. And the painting stayed 
and out of sight from about 19, she died about 1910, 1911 of tuberculosis, and they stayed out of sight till the late 1990s when they were uh, sold by an art gallery in Sydney. And they've been slowly coming back and forth onto the market in the last 20 years, but a remarkable artist. And if you think that's fascinating, there's another artist in Sydney, same era, uh, would have known, she would have actually known um, Isabel, uh, Sophie Stefanoni. And again, she died very young, also of tuberculosis, in about a little earlier, 1906. But uh, she too, her family had for again, for a number of years, five, six decades, until the 1990s, the works were kept in a box which had been sealed up in a part of the house that had been um, bricked up during some house renovations. And only when they were redoing their kitchen did they find this sort of sort of cache of things, a little sort of cupboard that was sort of a nook that was sort of full of things, including a big um, chest of unstretched canvases by Sophie. And these canvases were stretched. They've been exhibited around, uh, exhibited around Sydney. Someone's written a master's thesis on Sophie. And again, it's a, a complete, highly skilled artist. She won awards. She exhibited widely, as did Isabel. And yet the works were hidden for five decades in behind a sort of niche with a lot of other household items that were put there in a cupboard, which then got bricked over in the, about the 30s, 40s, and then reopened in the 1990s. It sort of sounds like a mythic story, but it's extremely well documented. And slowly the paintings have been given by the family to various art galleries, mostly in New South Wales. So there's very little known in Melbourne, although she occasionally turns up in art auctions and there are pieces in private collections down here. And this is another way that art, this is another, Jessie Scarville, this is another artist whose works were kept by two generations. She, her works weren't so much lost, but she was a very talented artist. She was purchased as a young woman in the mid 1890s by the Art Gallery of New South Wales. She again won awards. She was included in the prestigious 1898 exhibition in London of Australian art, which had a lot of Street and, and Roberts, and was the first really big exhibition of Australian art overseas mostly centred upon the Heidelberg School, mostly organised out of Sydney, but there were a few McCubbins and Richardsons from Melbourne as well, and Mathers. But she was part, very much part of a very ambitious professional clique. Then she married a man who wouldn't let her paint. So the painting stayed in the family. Her daughter lived a long life, and just before her death, she lived till she was 90, and was about 1910, the daughter showed the paintings to the curator of the S.H. Irvin Gallery in Sydney, which is run by the National Trust. It's like a little regional gallery with a lot of Edwardian paintings. The curator was enchanted, held an exhibition of the works, kept a lot of the works on donation from the daughter, and again, a number of them were distributed around other galleries in New South Wales, but also occasionally now come up on the market. This is, a, this is one that's been on the market in Melbourne again, Beautiful from the mid-1890s. Her work was often illustrated in the Art Society's catalogues, which is, it was a mark of only the elite and really skilled artists, the ones who were really admired, got their pictures illustrated in the catalogue. And generally not so many women as men, but Jessie's managed to get into the, the very top cadre of the, ex, of the groups and was illustrated in the catalogue and sometimes illustrated in the, in the press. This was usually only reserved for the very, very senior artists. Um, Jessie was considered one of those in the 1890s and then it just, she just gave it up for marriage. Likewise, another, again, very much the artworks mostly held by her daughter, a woman from artists from the 30s and 40s who then gave up painting when she married a, ma married a man who didn't want her to work in a professional manner because it was sort of, it was considered to almost be an insult to a man's ability to keep his wife that she, if she sold her paintings. And so her, there's a cache of her works, which are just coming out now, again, hidden away for a number of years. She later came back to painting and began exhibiting work across the states, uh, mostly in, Mel in Melbourne and Victoria, but sometimes interstate as well, but never had much of a professional career because there was such a, there was a break of about four decades in the middle of her life when she didn't paint. 
And also, not only marriage-interrupted careers, this is Jessie Evans, another plein air painter, worked in the 1880s, 1890s, pupil of, she was a pupil of um, National Gallery and also a pupil of uh, E. Phillips Fox at their Chartersville Artist Camp. Also went to a painting she did in Heidelberg, so she went to the Heidelberg camp with Robert Streeton and Withers and people like that, and then on to the um, Chartersville camp. But she was never allowed to sell her work because her father again felt that was sordid. Women handling money was seen as akin to prostitution, and it was also an, an insult to his ability to keep his daughter. So she used to paint a lot. She kept all the works all her life, and then Sybil Craig's mother, soon after she died, bought the whole collection of the works from her state, and they stayed with Sybil and her mother until the early 1990s, and again, they got scattered on the art market. So again, you see these beautiful quality paintings, top quality paintings for their era, impressive and appealing works, which were kept away from the public for decades. And uh, it's, it's just not a cliche, it actually did happen. It never happened, you know, because there was so much anxiety about a woman presenting herself in the public, particularly until until about the 20s, it became looser and freer, but then uh, back in the 50s, again, there was this movement to keep women in the house, and there was, there was a lot of things we can talk about, sort of these sort of psychological theories of mothering that fascism came about because of poor mothering and inadequate care of children. So there was a sort of social aspect to this idea of women having to go back to the house after the Second World War, but... Yes, so yeah, just giving you an idea of these sort of the cache of hidden works. And um, these are not the only case studies of women artists being extremely popular in a general cult cultural sense, even more so than amongst curators. I'll just show you a couple of other very popular books. The much loved in suburban reading groups. This is Stravinsky's Lunch and The Orchard by um, Drusilla Majesta. These have both been major bestsellers in Australia, but they also play a kind of this same story that you see with Beckett and Hester, this nexus of art history and the entrapment of the individual in lack of woman, in lack of opportunities or options. And it tells the story as well as sort of stories of various women in the novels. There's also discussion of a number of women artists, particularly Stella Bowen, Grace Cossington Smith, and the Italian. Baroque artist Artemisia Gentileschi. So it's a sort of mesh-up of mesh-up of art history and mesh-up of art history and popular literature and sort of popular consciousness raising. Um, the art histories, um, the art history tends to be quite poor in these books. Although they're popular, a lot of art professionals are a little bit frustrated by them because it tends to be rather deceptive. It, for the sake of the narrative, it tends to emphasise the frustration and lacks that these women experience to place them as struggling outsiders uh, in, in a hostile and capitalist conventional society. And it actually erases the professionalism of the women. There are many, many uh, actions in trying to push their work before the public, their deep commitment to art making, and their um, ability to battle on despite extraordinary pressures from society. Uh, so there's a sort of, I always think they have, they actually undermine, as well as celebrate women artists, they tend to pathologize them, particularly I think these Majeskita books. I don't, I feel a bit guilty to say that. So many people love these books, I find them a little irritating, as do a number of other art professionals. Perhaps I'm the only one who actually says it, and I've said it in a couple of articles, that um, a lot of other art professionals do find these, it's a bit frustrating. I mean, it's good it gets people introduced to the artists, but it also tells, it also enshrines a lot of unhelpful stereotypes about the artists. Another similar one is The Lost Mother by Anne Summers, which presents the story of a fa the famous author's own family history. That's Anne Summers' own fa family history, but intertwined with the life and work of Constance Stokes, an artist who painted her mother when her mother was a young girl. Uh, Stokes was greatly admired in the circle of Daryl Lindsay and Ursula Hoff and Professor Joseph Burke in the 1950s, but her works are now seen as less compelling apart from her very early works. This work has, book has also been quite a bestseller and taps again into the public 
fascination with art and society in the interwar years, but again is let down with having a rather weak grasp of the art context and a lot of narr dull narrative, I think, from the, from the author talking about her family and her own impressions, which is not as interesting as I think her fame may suggest. Uh, it often strays, strays away from the understanding and professional context and the considerable work of, that the artists achieve, and also it, it doesn't actually take notice of the work done by curators on the artist. Another similar recent publication that intervenes with the writer's opinions and voice constantly over the narrative of the artist and even overwrites the artist's opinions and experiences with the author's own ideas and fairly wild speculation about the artist, although no cruising uh, for men, is uh, Kath Kathleen O'Connor of Paris. It was only published about a year or so ago. It also uses the research of pure previous gallery curators with very little, I don't think enough acknowledgement, indicating that novelists contracted to commercial publishers are a little higher up the writing tee than authors who only publish by art museums. O'Connor was a very interesting character. She was a modernist gestural expressionist who lived and worked in Paris for several decades. She was never wealthy, but managed to live a moderate but independent lifestyle in Paris, keeping herself solvent by painting fabrics for couture houses and also sending fashion and social reports back to her from Paris to Australian newspapers for money, which at the stage, there was a lot of interest in first-hand reports of celebrities in Paris and Europe generally, and also fashion events in Paris, even at this very early date in the 20s. She exhibited with the major salons and groups in Paris, held occasional so solo shows, which received very good critical notice in Paris, but never generated much income. She never generated much... Um, she never generated many sales. And a lot when she returned to from uh, Paris to Australia in the 50s, she brought a lot of works back and supposedly dumped a lot of them into uh, Fremantle Harbour when she was charged a high degree of uh, import duty to bring her own works in. Uh, and, there's, there's, and there's people speculate, there are a number of artworks and poems about Kate throwing her paintings away, although there are so many survive, I'm not certain whether she herself might have sort of spread that rumour, and there are a lot still there. She also was um, very much uprooted from her comfortable life in Paris just before World War II, and she never regained her footings in Paris. She lost both her dwelling, her works, and her possessions left behind when she evacuated. I think her, her, her house was partly bombed, and then it was later... Um, the rest of it was taken down. She was in an apartment block. The rest of it was taken down for traffic management purposes soon after the war. And she had a long, long battle through the Department of Foreign Affairs with the French government to try and get restitution. She didn't get much of um, her possession, neither her possessions nor the, their value back from the French government. So there's some very interesting documents in the Australian archives about her. Uh, she, and she returned and lived a, a sad life in the, at the end of her life to Australia, a country she'd long ago rejected as provincial and hostile, although her sister was a notable figure in the Perth art and craft world. Like so many other Australian artists we've talked about, such as Clarice Beck and also other people such as Nora Heysen and Sybil Craig, she accumulated a large over of works, which didn't meet full professional public appreciation until later in her life or after, and, and even more so after her death. And again, like Beckett and Hester, the last four decades have seen O'Connor's works being acquired by major galleries across Australia. And the book about her is very much intended to fit in the same popular niche as some of the other books I've mentioned. So there is this whole interesting over of these sort of, sort of partly feminist novels, sort of introspective narratives of women talking about art, life, the meaning of life, and their own careers, interspersed within discussion of art history and these artists. But I, as I said, I prefer the straight art history rather than the, the, you know, the intrusive monologues about people's own frustrations and fears. That's just me. I suppose I'm a little bit of a hardliner. As I said, the dramatic, um, I think one of the popular, one of the reasons that this sort of genre emerged in the 1970s, this idea, the dramatic emotional aspects of these stories of women's lives, the idea of battling against the emotions and social odds, uh, fits in very neatly with feminist belief and practice in the 1970s. At that date, there was an almost Indiana Jones-like feel to the romantic crusade to rescue women's art from obscurity, to go into sort of 
to go into gallery storerooms and find them leaning against the wall or half out of their frame. I've heard a lot of people active in the 19, who were working in the 1970s and researching, saying that you know, people would say, oh, we haven't got any of her works. And you'd go into, they'd go into the storerooms and there they were, uncatalogued. And even in, the, even in 1995, uh, Deborah Edwards of the Art Gallery of New South Wales, so there was a big painting leaning against the, store, uh, against the side of the wall. And she said, well, what is that? And they said, oh, it's ne- we don't quite know how it got into collection. It's never been catalogued. And she looked at it, and it was mar- by Marie Tuck, who was a South Australian artist who lived for a long time in Paris, exhibited in the Salon, won medals in the Salon. And this was a major, streets, a major street and sort of genre scene of peasants in Brittany, painted in about 1900, that had lain for possibly nine decades, leaning against the, well, a number of decades leaning against the wall in the Art Gallery of New South Wales storeroom because no one quite knew what it was and what it was doing there and no one knew if it belonged to the gallery or not. So they decided to accession it and it was exhibited as a centrepiece of an exhibition in, of women artists in 1995. So right, sort of 70s and 80s, there were still people really discovering these artists and they were There'd been, acquired, there'd been quite a push to acquire women artists in the 20s and 30s. And then in the 40s and 50s and 60s, they were totally seen as irrelevant, they weren't important, and the artists, the art was just sort of left in the storerooms, never seen, never shown. And there's also another painting, a beautiful painting by Violet Teague, which used to be put up by the assistant curator. The curator in charge of the Australian collection hated the work, and every time he went on holidays, the assistant curator was a woman and would put the painting out. He came back and he'd tell her, get that off the wall. And it only came out permanently and it's now much loved when that particular curator got promoted out of his job and the, and the woman took over, the, his assistant took over from his job. But he would keep, he said, this, is an Australian, this isn't an Australian painting and as, uh, this is not irrelevant to Australia because it was a woman in an evening dress. And even... Um, When it was shown in an exhibition I curated at the Art Gallery of Western Australia, a local professor of art history said, oh, he said, that's awful. It's the sort of thing you used to have nightmares about if you visited a stately house in England. And you're sort of thinking, everyone loved it. It's the most beautiful, extraordinary school painting. It won a silver medal at the Panama Pacific Exhibition in 1915. Uh, Wonderful painting. And later it was slashed by someone, by someone with schizophrenia who said, she's not looking at me, she's hating, she, she hates me, and he slashed the canvas, but it, has, it was repaired, but luckily it didn't actually hit, it didn't slash the figure, only the background. But it's a much-loved painting in the Art Gallery of New South Wales, but it had this strange life as, for about 10 years when the staff battled over showing the painting. And this was in living memory. I'm, as Anna Russell says, I'm not making this up. You know, when I die, that story will die, but it did happen. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, there is this sort of, um, there was a sort of very romantic feeling about discovering women artists. The invisibly, it's um, also wasn't about just finding historical artists, it was about women discovering other women artists. Although throughout most of the early 20th century, up to the 50s, about 80% of enrollees in art schools were women, with, say, 20% were male. Around the 1960s, there was a sort of um, reform of art schools. It was trying to make the curriculum... So it's time to... Yep. Time, uh, just time to, make the, time to make the curriculum more modern. And um, they restricted who entered the school. So you might have, instead of a cohort of 20 with about 16 women and four men, you now had a cohort of about 10 with, say, nine men and one woman. So a woman could go straight through art school without seeing another woman painting in the studios. So a big thing of the 70s was meeting other artists. Um, I suppose the other thing, I suppose I should... Let's see, I might just flip through a couple of things and just sort of say... um, This is not... 70s was this period of discovery, you know, Judy Chicago's dinner party. Again, this is a work that's been loved by the public, Hated until very recently by art professionals, it, it languished in storage for 20 years till it found a home at the Brooklyn Museum, which now has built a complete feminist art museum around it, around this work, with this, this in the centre, a bit like the circular room of the, of the Eureka Centre and secondary galleries around it. And people come from around the world to see this artwork. It toured 
globally. It was seen by thousands in Melbourne at the exhibition buildings in 1988. And there was a huge women's dinner around the dinner party in the exhibition building. Some of you may actually remember this. I remember walking around. It was like you queued up for hours. It was like the rock at Mecca. You just walked around it, hoped to glance what you could see. It had to keep going because the queue was so long you couldn't stop. So, but this has now found a home again after, from the 1980s to 2010, it was without a home, just in storage. And of course, there's this interest in statistics, the Gorilla Girls, who are still going, they've been going since the 1980s, and they do these, dressed up as gorillas, they do, they enter art galleries, they make protests with these extraordinary posters that still are now considered artworks. Uh, in 1995, we had a major festival when across Australia, every public gallery except the National Gallery of Victoria, which disdained to be part of it, exhibited women artists for a period of time in 1995. There was about 200 exhibitions, I think, and also a number of university spaces, commercial spaces. But this was described as Madame Mao and Chairman Mao destroying the Australian gallery uh, and cultural commissars telling us what to like. There was this huge critical backlash, but of course the public loved it. But this is really weird reviews of this saying, you know, it's all second rate art that's been forced upon us by Chairman Joan and her fight, gang of five and all this stuff. It was seen as sort of this Maoist destruction of the pure Australian nationalist art temple, just because they took off the, women art, women art, the male painters and put women painters up. And in fact, in this National Gallery in Canberra, the director actually ordered the exhibition to be closed. He said, people come looking for Tom Roberts and Arthur Street, and they'll be very angry if they're not on the walls. So it closed early in Canberra. But this is the book that covers all the exhibitions. I, I, I was working very much on this project. And finally, the last thing is, if you think perhaps that I'm making all this up, as Anna Russell says. Uh, this is some of the, this is just one of the many graphs about state, about the state of the Australian art world. Um, I'll just give you a couple of statistics. Um, yes, 30 um, women are 75% of art school graduates still in 2018, but only 34% of artists exhibited in public museums and galleries. Uh, this is state galleries exhibit, exhibitions around Australia in 2018. 66.02 are men, 33.98 were women, and the color, the different color there, green is color, I can't remember all the colors. Orange is trans people, green is collaboration of straight men and straight women, and the purple and the, some of the other colors are other combinations of collaborators. But basically you can see the statistics. And the um, University of Sydney University, Sydney University of Technology in 2018 published data from 40 years of art auctions, international global art auctions revealed that women artists attract prices that are 50% lower than works by men. They said the results reveal the struggle and cultural bias facing women artists in getting recognition and true compensation for their work. And this is true when they even removed exceptionally high-priced figures such as Rembrandt, Da Vinci, Picasso and Van Gogh. Without those outliers, the bias still remained. Now, I could talk a lot more about the return of women artists since the late 20, 20, 2000s, about 27. We've had a number of global exhibitions. The idea also of diversifying the content, not only gender-wise, but racially of art Art, muse art museums, particularly the Tate has looked at the contribution of non-American, French or English artists to developing modernism. And as I said, we're celebrating, I'll just say, the end up with the last slide, Know My Name. Uh, this is the festival in Canberra. Uh, it has this big exhibition. There are also put a lot of money into putting pictures of women artists into transport hubs, shopping malls, on freeway billboards, to try and show women's art to people who don't know much about art. Now, I think it's a good idea, but it got stymied, of course, the one stymied by people not being able to go to transport hubs or malls during COVID. And also, I think it's too enigmatic. A lot of people don't actually know. When they see this, know my name, 
It doesn't actually say, there's a little tiny writing saying it's by a certain artist. It's not actually educating people. I mean, I suppose that's me being rather clunky and conservative, but it's fabulous to see them, these billboards. So, yeah, that just gives you a little overview of some, about the way women artists have been treated in the mainstream. Thank you very much.